Greetings, nerdlings. Today, our video lecture is going to be discussing the mitochondria and chloroplasts. So as an overview, mitochondria and chloroplasts are the organelles that convert energy to forms that cells can use for work. Mitochondria converts glucose into energy in the form of ATP. Chloroplasts use energy from the sun to create ATP and carbohydrates. Now the ATP is the energy that is active energy, right here. Carbohydrates are the form of stored energy. Now if you think about it, animals and plants both store different types of carbohydrates. Plants store their carbohydrates in the form of a polysaccharide called starch. They also have other carbohydrates that they store in their cell walls, which is called cellulose. And the cellulose is actually responsible for composing those cell walls. Now animals store their carbohydrates in the form of glycogen, which is also a polysaccharide. Poly meaning many, and saccharide meaning, if you said sugar, then you're correct. So it's important to see the many similarities between mitochondria and chloroplasts. They both transform energy, and they both generate ATP. They both have double membranes, and they are both semi-autonomous organelles. That means that they can basically exist by themselves. They both move, they change shape, and they also divide. They have their own internal ribosomes, they have their own DNA, and they also have their own enzymes. So the first organelle we're going to talk about is the mitochondria. Cellular respiration takes place in mitochondria, and this is how we generate the majority of our ATP. We generate that ATP from the breakdown of sugars, fats, and other fuels. In the presence of oxygen, we call this aerobic respiration. It breaks down larger molecules into smaller molecules and generates energy. This type of reaction where we're breaking down larger molecules into smaller molecules is called catabolism. That's when we scratch the bonds apart. That is a catabolic enzymatic reaction, meaning those enzymes within the mitochondria are catalyzing that reaction, and we call it a catabolic reaction because cats rear, scratch those bonds apart. They do this through the process of adding water, and when we add water to something, what do we call that? That's when we call it the process of hydrolysis, hydro meaning water, and lysis meaning to split. Now the opposite of that is called anabolic or an anabolism. Anabolic reactions are when enzymes take water out of things and they bond together through the process of dehydration synthesis. So the structure of the mitochondria, it's composed of two membranes. We have our smooth outer membrane, which is right here, and then we have a highly folded inner membrane right here. All of the folds in the mitochondria are called cristae. We have a fluid filled space that are between the two membranes. This is called the mitochondrial matrix and it's where the DNA, the ribosomes, and all of the enzymes are located. So here we have our matrix, we have our little ribosomes right here, and we have mitochondrial DNA. Mitochondrial DNA is very similar to bacterial DNA. It, is, it occurs in the form of plastids, which are circular forms of DNA. So why does that mitochondria have two membranes? Think about why we need lots of curves and folds. We want to increase the surface area. When we increase the surface area, we can increase the amount of ATP that's going to be produced. So what else divides like mitochondria? Prokaryotic cells do. They undergo a process called binary fission, and this is very similar to the process of how mitochondria divide. So in binary fission, we start off with a prokaryotic cell with its DNA. Now remember that prokaryotic cells do not have a true nucleus, so they don't divide in the same way that eukaryotic cells do. They undergo binary fission. So eventually, the cell will split into two, just like the mitochondria. So what does this tell us about the evolution of eukaryotes? That's some food for thought, and I wouldn't be surprised if I saw this on some type of free response essay. Hint, hint, wink, wink. 
So almost all eukaryotic cells have mitochondria. There may be one very large mitochondrion, or there could be hundreds to thousands of individual mitochondria in each cell. The number of mitochondria is correlated with the aerobic metabolic activity of the cell. The more activity the cell undergoes, the more energy it uses. The more energy it uses, the more ATP it has to synthesize. The more ATP it has to synthesize, the more mitochondria it's going to have. So what type of cells do you think would have a lot of mitochondria? If you're thinking muscle cells like this baby right here, then you're correct. Our muscle cells need lots of energy. Another type of cell that needs lots of energy are our nerve cells. They're constantly having to transmit impulses from our brain to the rest of our body and back to our brain. So if I touch a hot stove, I need all of that energy to tell my brain, ouch, it's hot, and remove my hand. So the next type of organelle we're going to talk about are the chloroplasts. Now these are found only in plant cells and photosynthetic algae, which are protists. Chloroplasts are plant organelles, and the plant organelles are broken up into classes called plastids. We have amyloplasts. These store starch in roots and tubers. And it sounds kind of like amylose, which is the sugar or starch. And the enzyme amylase breaks down the sugar amylose. We have chromoplasts, which store pigments for fruits and for flowers. And then, what you guys might be used to hearing, we have chloroplasts. These store chlorophyll and they function in the process of photosynthesis, where we take energy from the sun and convert it into oxygen and glucose that other animals can use. Chloroplasts are found in the leaves and in other green parts of the cell. They're also found in eukaryotic algae. So the structure of the chloroplast is very similar to the structure of the mitochondria. It too has two membranes. It has an outer membrane and an inner membrane. So here we have our outer membrane, and then we have our inner membrane right here. We also have an internal fluid-filled space that has the stroma. So here we have our stroma, our internal fluid-filled space. Inside the stroma, we have all of the DNA, the enzymes, and the ribosomes. If you look at these stacks right here, each individual disc is called a thylakoid, and they have what we call a thylakoid membrane that surrounds the disc. Now a whole stack of these thylakoids is called a granum. So the granum is what we refer to when we're referring to an entire stack. If we're talking about just one of these individual discs, then we call it a thylakoid. And like I said, each thylakoid has its own thylakoid membrane. So why do you think the internal sacs have membranes? Same reason why our mitochondria have all of those different folds in it. We want to increase the surface area because this is going to increase the amount of ATP we can produce with the enzymes that are inside the chloroplast. So again, the chloroplast functions in the process of photosynthesis, where it generates ATP and synthesizes sugars. The sugar that it synthesizes is called glucose. It transforms solar energy into chemical energy, and it produces sugars from carbon dioxide and water. It is semi-autonomous just like the mitochondria are, meaning that it can move, change shape, and divide on its own. It can also reproduce by pinching in two. So who else divides like that? Remember a few slides back? Prokaryotic cells. So mitochondria and chloroplasts are different from other membrane-bound organelles that are found within the cell. They are not part of the endomembrane system like the cytoskeleton, the endoplasmic reticulum, and the Golgi bodies are. <coughs> they can grow and reproduce on their own. That's why we call them semi-autonomous organelles. They have proteins that are primarily from free ribosomes in the cytosol, and they have a few of their own ribosomes as well. They have their own circular chromosomes. These direct the synthesis of proteins that they produce on their own for their internal ribosomes. So who else has circular chromosomes that are not bound by a nucleus? Prokaryotic cells, or bacteria. 
So this is one thing I want to make sure you guys take good notes on, the endosymbiosis theory. You will definitely see this on one of your free response questions for your next exam. So this states that basically mitochondria and chloroplasts were once their own entities, meaning they were once their own free living bacteria. They were engulfed by an ancestral eukaryotic cell and they became an endosymbiont. So think about symbiosis. That's a relationship between two organisms. And we have three main types. We have mutualism, commensalism, and parasitism. In this case, it would be a mutualistic symbiotic relationship. So the cell lives within another cell, or the host. It's a partnership. From an evolutionary standpoint, they have an advantage for both organisms. One, either the mitochondria or the chloroplast, supplies the cell with energy. The other, meaning the cell itself, supplies the mitochondria and the chloroplasts with raw materials as well as protection. This scientist right here, Lynn Margulis, was the one who first discovered or came up with the endosymbiosis theory in 1981, which is my birth year. So if you look at this picture here, it shows the endosymbiosis theory. So in our time, we start off with an ancestral prokaryotic cell. It eventually starts enfolding, and we start getting into our eukaryotic cells. Once our eukaryotic cells form, and we have our endomembrane system, they engulf mitochondria and chloroplasts. So right here, we have the engulfing of an aerobic heterotrophic prokaryote, which now we call the mitochondria. Same thing for our chloroplasts we have the engulfing of a photosynthetic prokaryotic cell, which was the chloroplast. And eventually, we get an ancestral photosynthetic eukaryotic cell with both mitochondria and chloroplasts. So like I said, make sure you pay special attention to the endosymbiosis theory, both in this lecture and when you're taking your notes in the book. I'll see you guys next time. This is the Queen Nerdling, signing out.